Good morning, guys. Um, I just sent you all some stuff on Oscar Schindler and also on a man named Poldick Pfefferberg. And those are two people that you really need to know before we start actually watching the movie Schindler's List. Um, now, you know, first quarter we did a lot with people who resisted. And we learned a lot about some really cool special heroes. Um, people like, of course, um, Sir Nicholas Winton. Um, who went really far out of his way to save 669 kids. Um, we learned about Irina Sendler in the Warsaw Ghetto, right? She saved thousands of children. We learned about, um, of course, Meep Geese, who put herself in harm's way to help the uh, Frank family and the other people upstairs. And, you know, we could go on, but there were so many wonderful people over there in Europe who saved other people at the risk of their own lives every day. And um, it, it's really cool. And Oscar Schindler is one of those people, but not conventionally. And that's one of the cool things about his story, actually. So I wanna tell you a little bit more about these notes. So I definitely want you to read through them because I've even amended them some to put some things that I would have put um, had we been in class together and talking. But basically, Oscar uh, was really not a good guy as you'll see. As the movie opens up, um, he is a member of the Nazi party. He is schmoozing and rubbing elbows with some of the very top Nazi SS men and, you know, Nazi officials. And he's doing it so that he can better his own position. He's doing it out of greed completely. He's really hoping to make a fortune. That's the whole reason that he came to Krakow, Poland was to make a fortune. He says in there that he wants to um, have um, a steamer trunk, two steamer trunks full of money. And um, so he comes there as an opportunist, okay? He comes to Krakow after things have gotten really bad and all the businesses have been stripped away from the Jews who owned them. He acquires, uh, in an interesting way, as you'll see in the movie, um, he actually acquires more than one factory, but the, um, the factory that is in the, the film is um, the one that makes pots and pans, okay? And that's the one that's associated with the Jewish people there in Krakow. So he basically hires the Jews because they're the cheapest form of labor. They don't get one penny of it, which you'll see in the movie as well. All of their wages are sent to the SS. So this is yet another way that we understand perhaps how the Nazis could do all that they did because for all of those people, all of those people who were basically slave labor, um, they got the money, they got all of their earnings. It's so ridiculous and ludicrous, I can't imagine. But anyway, he hires them because they're the cheapest form of labor. Um, he doesn't really care at all at first, as you'll see, could care less really, but there will come a time when you see, there will come a time that he will change. It's like a click. It's like, it's just weird. And it's such a cool moment in the movie. Um, he becomes really good friends with the commandant there, um, Amon Gut. They form a, um, a very interesting relationship, one that he can profit from, from in several different ways. But you will learn about Gut tomorrow. Today, it's more Schindler and another one of the men who was very important in this story, um, Poldek Pfefferberg. But anyway, he hires Jews and then um, he, ends up, he ends up saving them in such an interesting way. But it was never, ever his intention. That was not why he went there at all. And as you'll see, um, he will end up, that money that he talked about, those steamer trunks full of money, You'll see, he ends up literally paying for individually buying 1,100 people. And it is such an amazing story. I mean, it really is. And I'm so excited to embark on it with you guys. Um, he bribes a lot of um, Nazi officials. He spends all of his own money to keep these people safe, to buy their freedom, but also to keep them safe until the end of the war. And after the war was over, he had to flee because he was considered a war criminal. And um, he ended up back with his people. They would basically call themselves Schindler Jews for the rest of their lives. And some of them are still alive, but not very many. Um, they would take care of him for the rest of his life. They would all become successfully, financially successful people after the war. And he would um, go back to being the loser that he'd always been. And he 
they would support him. Those Schindler Jews, the people that he saved their lives would end up supporting him and taking him under their wing. And for the rest of his life, they, they had a special bond and relationship. And he was recognized in Israel by the Yad Vashem, that big museum there, for his um, wonderful things that he did for the Jewish nation. And he passed away in um, 1974 when I was about five years old of liver failure, which doesn't surprise me because he's an avid drinker, smoker, just a crazy, not a good guy. <laughs> he does wonderful things, but you'll see he's kind of a dirty dog um, as the movie opens until part of the way through. So um, after that, I want you to please look hard at the guy named Poldek Pfefferberg. I just sent you those notes as well. And he was a Polish Jew, okay? And he lived in Krakow, Poland. He was born and raised there. He was actually a teacher. He was a fiscal education teacher. He fought in the Polish, um, he fought in the war, World War I, but he also was in the Polish resistance, that thing that we saw in The Pianist, okay? Um, he was wounded and he escaped. And he ended up in the Krakow ghetto, okay? And Schindler actually knocked on his mother's door and had heard about her and asked her to hi um, hired her to redecorate his new apartment. And that's how he met him. He ended up in a partnership with Oscar Schindler, which would absolutely save his life and a number of his um, relatives lives. So he became, he becomes his black market supplier. Um, Schindler needs a lot of things and he needs a lot of things that are absolutely illegal. You can't get your hands on them, but pull deck can. And so he becomes his black market dealer. And his wife, Mila uh, Pfefferberg, is also, um, they're big characters in the movie. And they were big characters in Schindler's life. They were both uh, on the list, okay? So they were number 173 and 195 on the list, the, what would be called the, the Schindler's list. So they would be saved by Schindler. And after the war, they came to New York City in 1947, so just two years after the war. He changed his name because it was just too much Leopold Pfefferberg. He changed it to something easier. Leopold Page, and many people did that. And he had a leather repair shop in Manhattan, but then he moved out to the West Coast, he and his wife. They moved to um, LA, Beverly Hills, and had a really swanky shop um, in the 1950s that um, was an Italian leather goods shop. And he had a lot of people come in and out. And basically, he remained close to Schindler his whole life too, but he swore like a pledge, a vow early on after the war to always tell the story of Oscar Schindler and what he did. And Oscar didn't really tell it. And not a lot of people did, but to uh, Pfefferberg, it was like his life's work. He had to tell people about the miraculous thing that he had done in saving so many people. And so basically, uh, it's a funny story. He ends up getting this woman to listen to him kind of almost forcibly, kiddingly, but forcibly. And she introduces him to her husband, who's an MGM exec, and they end up buying the rights to the story. There's no film made, but then all of a sudden in 1980, that's when things changed. Um, an Australian writer who happened to be in Beverly Hills ended up in his shop, a guy by the name of Thomas Keneally. And long story short, Thomas Keneally ended up listening to Poldek, um, Pfefferberg, or Leopold Page, whatever you want to call him. And uh, he ended up writing the book called Schindler's Ark, which would become Schindler's List. And Spielberg bought the rights to the film. And we'll talk a little bit more about that tomorrow before we actually get started watching. But he waited 10 years to make sure that it was made right. And Poldek was actually an advisor on the film. So I think that's also very cool. You get a lot of authenticity when you have somebody who lived through all that. And he convinced Spielberg to go back to Krakow, Poland and film it there because apparently Spielberg was considering several other places. But this is one of the things he said is that you have to film the streets. You have to film in the streets where the blood, the Jewish blood was spilled and that convinced Spielberg. And so um, they were actually Spielberg's guests at the Academy Awards when the film won seven Oscars. That's pretty darn cool too. And um, let's see, he last saw Oscar Schindler in 1973, so a few years before his death, and that was the 25th anniversary of the creation of the Israeli government. And um, Leopold Pfefferberg, or Page, died in 2001 in California. And 
was the man I feel who was responsible for bringing that story to us. Such a wonderful story. So um, just read the notes and kind of, kind of get yourself ready today. There's no work today, but we'll have some uh, soon. Okay. Have a great day. Get some sunshine.